Good morning, online people. Sometimes this projector doesn't want to do its thing. Okay, so you go from our homepage, group project, and then what you'll see is this IRB template. I have basically filled out half of this for you <laughs> to make it easy for you. Um, and then one thing I should tell you too is that like this is not going to go through formal IRB review. I'm a former IRB co-chair, so I'm just going to review it just because it'll take two weeks to go through and I don't want to hold you all up and we really only need to go through IRB if you're ever planning on presenting something off campus which like rarely has happened for these um but we check all the boxes that if you wanted to do that we could get IRB approval after the fact if that makes sense so um we're going to do sort of informal IRB review so when you download the template this is what you've got um so this is the actual form you would fill out um, were you to actually be submitting this to our IRB. I was then realizing like this part's out of date. That's from like 2016 before we became a university. Um, yeah, you all know my email now. So um, there are three levels of types of studies that we look at. 
uh, and our IRB. And this is pretty consistent from place to place. I might call them different things, but level one would be if you already had archival data. So let's say we wanted to go through, you know, the past five, seven years of the assessment that our students take in 495 and see how they were doing. We already have that data, so we would just have to get permission to analyze it in a new way. And that's level one. Level two is what pretty much every study since I've been here has said. <laughs> it's essentially you're doing a study where you're collecting data from people, but you're not doing anything that's going to really harm them, essentially, or even bring up big questions. Level three um, would be if you are going to do something that's potentially harmful. Um, so we talked about this when we did the example IRBs with the, the student who used the Red Bull and the Sprite. Um, oh, that was in my other class, sorry. Um, but in my other class, we talked about this, where there was a student who randomly assigned people to drink Red Bull or Sprite. And like, this is the only time I've ever heard of come close to like considering doing a level three because it was like someone could have a bad reaction to the caffeine and the Red Bull. And so she just put contingencies in place. But for example, if people want to measure depression, um, I always tell them if I'm supervising them to use a, a measure of depression that does not include items about suicidality. Because especially if you're collecting data in person, if that person endorses suicidality, it is then your responsibility to query that, get them a referral right away, right? Make sure they're safe. And I don't think that's anything an undergrad should have to do, um, even for grad students, that can be scary. So um, I always just, that would go to a level three, is basically what I'm saying. So I always just tell people like there are other measures of depression that'll get at the same thing. We don't have to use the ones with those items. All right, so I already checked it off for y'all. Y'all are all level two. You get to come up with a fun, snappy title for your research with your group. And it can just be something like creating a measure of whatever. That's fine. I'm not really good at snappy titles most of the time. And I find like for conferences when I submit stuff with snappy, snappy titles, it seems to be less likely to get accepted to train me sad. Like I came up with a panel discussion about teaching diverse courses um, that I submitted to a conference for this year called Not Just Old White Guys. And uh, that didn't get accepted. So, <laughs> um, so uh, then it's submitted by you can copy paste this for all your group members. So some of you might have three lines here of name, email, department, phone. Some of you might have more. Basically, you only need to fill out the parts that are highlighted in blue. Everything else I filled out for you. Um, I've got my contact info. None of y'all are getting federal research dollars. So then you're going to write an abstract. And I recommend you actually do this last. So write the whole IRB and then go back and write the abstract. Don't forget to do it. Remind yourself. But it's just a brief summary of what you're doing in your study. And so once you fill out the rest of the IRB, this will be really easy to write. Right? I do this with articles that I write in a minute as well. I will um, write the abstract last on those so that Again, I have like everything conceptualized in my head. I know what I want to say. I know what I want to highlight. So then your research questions. I've basically, again, written for you. It's your first time doing an IRB for most of you. So I wanted to make this as easy as possible while still giving you the experience of what it'd be like to do this. So uh, we will examine the reliability and validity of a new questionnaire we designed to measure. You fill in what your questionnaire is about here. <laughs> um, and then <laughs> we have a questionnaire will be correlated with the name of your secondary questionnaire, showing convergent validity. It will not be correlated with the name of your other questionnaire for divergent validity. And so this is one of the questions I've been getting. How do you find those other questionnaires? So I'm going to show you a couple ways to find them. So if you know, um, just because Stephen and I talked last time, I'm going to use the eating disorders group, also something I'm familiar with, right? So you know what topic you're doing. You can actually just Google eating disorders questionnaire and see what comes up. And a lot of times um, you will find a full PDF 
of the questionnaire. It was really cool. And you might find several, and then you can decide which one you like the most, essentially. So like here's a whole thing of screening tools, right? Um, so there's like one specifically for eating disorders and a couple of different other ones. So you could choose which ones you want it, right? The other way, the more like formal way to find it is through our library's resources. So if you just go to our homepage, and then I always just go through Beacon just because it's easier and they've got the library under both students and faculty. So, okay, there's a databases is probably the easiest way to do it. So library homepage databases. If you go to P, the one I like to use is called Psych Info. You can also use any of the other psychologically related ones. Um, there's lots of them, so it has psychology in the title. Okay, that's fine. Um, so then let's see again, I want to look at eating disorders here. And I could just search. This is something that I discovered, I think, a couple years into using this version of the database, which is really helpful. So if you scroll down on the side here, there's a whole bunch of different ways you can limit stuff. And one of the options is tests and measures. So if you click tests and measures, it will actually give you the names of the questionnaires they're using. And then you can like limit it by those, or you can then Google those questionnaires by name and see if you can find the full thing. So, and this will work for anything. So let's say we wanted to do this about, I'm just gonna make up a topic, something like self-esteem, right? Okay, same thing. I could just scroll down and now we see, you know, all of the different measures of self-esteem and it looks like a lot of people are measuring it with depression. <laughs> Um, something more abstract. That would be like racial bias, right? Just because I was just talking about that in my previous class. Okay, so then you have like the modern racism scale and things like that. And again, if I wanted to try to find that, I could just go to Google and say, okay, modern racism scale. And I could find some articles about it. And it looks like here's a PDF of it. Yep, and there's all the items. So it's sort of a combo of Google and the databases, but Google really is where you can find most of those. And the two questionnaires you are finding to give in addition to your questionnaire are one that seems to measure the same thing, and then one that seems to measure something that like might be related, but it's a different concept. So like if I was measuring eating disorders, I might choose a measure of like depression as my one for discriminant validity. They might have some things in common, right? People will both be kind of upset if they have them, but they shouldn't be super highly correlated, right? So then this can um, give you that discriminant validity. So basically when you're Participants fill out everything, and we'll get to all this as we go through this, but they are going to fill out a demographic form where they just tell you basic information about themselves. They're going to fill out the questionnaire you create. Then they're going to fill out the questionnaire you found that measures the same thing for convergence of validity. And then they're going to fill out the questionnaire you find that measures something kind of different for discriminant validity. So they'll fill out full questionnaire. And once you all, well, I mean, one thing you might want to think about as you go through this is think about how you want to do it. So in the past, I've had people approach people in the library. I had a group, I think maybe the first time I taught this that messed up the first time and like only gave their questionnaire. And I was like, well, you can't really do the assignment. So they um, made copies, went to the grill and got 30 people in like an hour. <laughs> And then they had their right data with the demographics of the other two questionnaires. Um, so you could do something like that. You could also put it in a Google form, which is groups are interested. I can like show you how to do that. 
or if anyone has like a survey mode or a whole church account, you could use that as well. So if you want to do it online, that's fine. I also had folks ask me if you're stuck with students, no. If you want to put it online or give it to people you know in person, that's fine. Just make sure your IRB says like we'll be um, you know recruiting for people we don't want to and that's fine. Yeah. How many uh, people do you want to? Thirty. Thirty. Yep. Exactly. Okay. Yep. Yeah. So you just give it to them all at once, essentially. And typically, especially if you don't choose super long questionnaires and you, you don't make a super long questionnaire, these will take ten minutes or less. For people. Which is why you could just like walk up to people in the grill and have them do it if you want to do it that way. Yeah. So then for your method, um, you change this if you are going to do it online. So I wrote this pre-COVID when I assumed everyone would just do paper and pencil questionnaires. But if you're going to put it online, you could just say this here. Like participants will fill out a Google form and that's fine. Um, and then again, there, everyone's going to do some demographics. Then you have the name of your questionnaire you came up with. And then those two questionnaires we just talked about. The one that measures the same thing and the one that measures something different, both that already exist. And as I said, it's anticipated participation will take 10 minutes. I wrote this part for you uh, for confidentiality. Pretty easy. Um, storage. This is something you need to think about. So if you are using paper and pencil questionnaires, who is going to store them and where? Right? Um, this is not something you could just like leave out on a desk in the library, right? You don't want uh, people's data getting out there. Um, nor do you want to lose your data, right? Like if that has happened to people in the past. So think about, you know, uh, you know, will it be kept in one of your dorm rooms, or do you have someone else has a really safe place to keep it? Yeah, you would just put it'll be stored essentially in the cloud, but only group members will have access to the data. Yeah, good question. Because you can obviously only share it with your group members and then you're good to go. Um, I filled all this out. The only thing you need to do here is highlight whether you're going to use men, women, or both. I'm just realizing we need to update this because it is not inclusive of all genders. So I'll let the IRB know that. Um, <laughs> if, you, if you're using all genders, just assume both covers it for now. But I will definitely talk to Dr. Ariel and Dr. Martorell about that. Um, and then again, old BWU students will be approached and you can say where, and again, if you are going to do it online, you can say they will be emailed the link. I will beg them in the email to take it basically. Um, or, you know, if you're not gonna use students, you can change this to be like, uh, it'll be posted on social media so that my friends and family will take it. And if you want to do a mix, you could do a mix too. If you want to do some students, some off campus, that's fine. Just tell me where you're going to get your folks. Again, filled this all up for you. Um, the informed consent, I have a boilerplate for we'll go over. I did the benefits and risks for you already, so no worry about it. Basically, it's the educational benefit of training y'all in the methods of psychological science. All righty. Then you get to digitally sign this. Again, you decide if someone's going to be the primary investigator or if you're just going to copy paste this. All right, here is that informed consent. So this is a part that people often find daunting, but it's really not, I promise. Um, so you just put your names up here. Uh, I had to highlight this because in the past, people just left it as investigator. I think they just didn't see it. <laughs> so put your names up there. Um, describe the general purpose and goals of your study, but you're not revealing your actual hypothesis. So it could be something as vague as to create, if we're doing the eating disorder, want to create a new study uh, or a new measure, a new survey to measure eating behaviors or something like that uh, and compare it to existing measures. It can be pretty vague. Um, so then what will the participation involve? And this is where you want to say, like, filling out a questionnaire online or doing paper and pencil. Um, and again, 
thinking it'll take about 10 minutes. Um, you know, they might have some risks if like, the questions might uh, distress them. Um, you know, and it will add to the public knowledge. It will add to knowledge about measuring this item. You can also talk about it adding to your um, education here. Um, yeah, and then they will be debriefed. There's also a sample debrief here. Um, so you can just say, you'll get it right after. Um, typically, like let's say you're doing it online with a Google form, it'll just be the last page of the survey. Like, thank you for participating, here's the debriefing. If you're doing it in person, typically, you give it to them when they turn in their questionnaires. And we'll go over what that actually means in a second. You put your contact info, I've got mine. And then, you know, again, if they're doing it in person, we want a place where they can sign it. If they're doing it online, um, you basically can delete the sign place because we typically just have them check a box that says say agree. Um, they do have to be 18 or over just because if you're going to do kids, anyone, I know that like 17 year olds are not really kids, right? But like technically and legally, we have to get parental consent then. And that's just too big of a headache for y'all. You don't need to do that. Just, just use 18 and over people. That'll be fine. All right, demographics. So you all heard some flexibility here. Posted on Blackboard. Uh, back to Blackboard, there is a sample demographics questionnaire. You can feel free to just copy and paste this and use it. Or um, if you want to change it up, you can. So like, for example, I wrote this sexual orientation question years ago, and I sort of hate it now. Um, so if you want to write a more inclusive one, feel free. Or if you just don't think sexual orientation is relevant, you can delete it. Um, you know, for example, let's say you were going to do the eating disorders one, you might want to ask, have you ever been diagnosed with an eating disorder before, right? If you're doing one about, um, you know, relationship satisfaction, what's your marital status, that type of thing. Are you in a relationship right now? So I would say keep gender, age, you're in school, if you're using students <laughs> um, and ethnicity, but then be flexible, whatever would be most relevant for your study after that. Yeah. Right, if you decided to pick your mental, yeah. And if y'all don't have enough copies, I can run them off for you. I've done that in the past, so, yep. Yes, yes, so if you're in Blackboard, it's under group project. Um, and then here's the template and here's the sample informed consent and here's the demographic. No, the really nice thing about that is it'll just give you a link and then you can just email it to people. And again, I usually recommend the students require this plug them when they do it. Um, and they can just fill it out wherever they are. In fact, most like Google Forms, Survey Monkey are now mobile friendly. So they can just fill it out on their phone. I filled out a Google form for an appointment I have later today, like over the weekend while I was hanging out with my parents on my phone. So they're pretty easy to do. So, yeah. That's a good question. Um, I would say probably 10 is a good minimum. If you want to have more, that's fine. Don't get too, too many because think about the fact that what we call participant burden. Like you don't want your participants to have to do so much stuff that they don't want to keep filling out your questionnaire, right? <laughs> but yeah, I would say most of the groups that have done this in the past have probably done 10 to 20 questions. Anything under 10, and it gets hard to get good reliability because you just have too few of them. Yeah, that's going to be, that's probably one of the most fun parts coming up with the questions if you're doing them there. Like, what do we want to actually ask people about the topic that we're looking at? Yeah, so everything you need is here. And what you might want to do is like take this IRB and put it in a Google uh, doc so that you all can 
within different parts of it with your group. All righty. So copy paste the demographics, tweak it however you want, and then you copy paste your questionnaire. So first put your questionnaire that you created, those 10 to 20 items. Then copy paste the uh, questionnaire you find that measures the same thing. And then copy paste the questionnaire you find that measures something kind of different. And you don't need to do anything else with them. Just copy paste the items in here. <laughs> All right. And then you have the debriefing. I'm realizing there is one typo here. Heidi is no longer here. Um, so you can just delete her name and leave Bill. Um, so you basically just say, thank you for participating in the study. Uh, our one purpose of the study is to determine reliability and validity of a new scale. And then you explain to them what your study measures. So the debriefing form does a couple things. In educational settings like we're in right now, it's meant to inform people about sort of the research process and how it works and what you're doing. It also provides information that in case anything distressed them during taking the study, they have some contact info. So one thing I will say is if you are thinking you're going to get people off campus, um, obviously like the Student Counseling Center information doesn't get help. <laughs> But I do have some national resources. So if your group is thinking you're going to do off campus, just shoot me an email and I can give you those links. Um, and you can put that in and place with the uh, counseling center information. And then it thanks you. And then uh, you put your names and emails, and that's it. So again, it looks really daunting, but most of this is just filling in a few things here or there. Yeah. Can you just do a real briefing of the staff and purposes of the Sure, yep. Okay, so you've got, and then we have a right on the board. So let me try to do it over here so our outline folks can see it too. All right, so you've got your scale you're creating. Right, that's your 10 to 20 items you wrote. Then you have an existing scale. That measures the same thing. And you might have to like stretch a little bit here. So for example, I had a student a few years ago who did one um, about mindfulness, specifically at BWU. Obviously, she wasn't going to find a number measure of just that, but she found an existing measure of mindfulness. And then three is an existing scale. Measure something different. Yeah, and it should be somewhat related, it shouldn't be random, but like, um, let's say I was making a scale about self-esteem, right? Um, I might choose to include a measure about like judging other people, right? So you're going to kind of let you know, like, um, you know, in theory, your creative scale of self esteem, right, should relate more to an existing scale of self esteem rather than like judging other people, right? Um, but in theory, they could be related, right? So it's possible that you will find a significant correlation with your discriminant validity measure. But in theory, the one with the existing measure that does the same thing, your conversion with the discriminant measure, uh, validity, there we go, measure. Um, so this will be convergent. Validity. I think I said the word validity today. And this will be divergent validity. So basically, all that math and fun stuff we did at the beginning of the semester, you're putting it in the point scale. So you're going to find out convergent validity by correlating these two. You're going to find out divergent validity by correlating these two. The other thing we'll do is we'll do um, a measure of reliability. We'll do an alpha. 
Um, and then probably either Monday or Wednesday next week, we'll go back to the computer lab and we'll do another review of SPSS because I know about half the people weren't able to be here that day. It's really hard to do it by watching the video. Um, and it never hurts to like refresh. Yeah. Oh, that's a good question. No, <laughs> because existing scales are written like basically the reason we want to use existing scales is they always have they already have reasons behind them, right? So we want to show that your scales related to scales that have a lot of reasons behind them. So if you cut them, all of a sudden basically that reaches is gone. So what I recommend is if you find really long ones, see if you can find a short one. Or sometimes a long measure will have a, what they call a subscale where like certain items match this. So let's say you wanted to study personality traits, right? And you're particularly interested in shyness. Well, there's an existing scale called the uh, five factor inventory that looks at five personality traits. And one of them is introversion, which is basically shyness. So then you just take the items that measure introversion and use them. And if you only help finding those measures, I'm a pretty good whiz at finding them. I might even have some of them already. So please email me and I will, I will do my Google. I will search my files. I'm glad to help in any way, shape, or form. Any other questions? Okay, so technically Friday, but if y'all need more time, that's okay. That's Friday at midnight. Um, if y'all need more time, that's fine. Basically, I originally had this due much earlier, but just missed it. And I think it was maybe Ashanti was like, this. yes, that's right. That's right. I think Ashanti was like, um, what about this? <laughs> and I was like, dang it. Um, but the only reason I want you to get it done fairly soon is that once I look it over, you can start collecting your data, right? And if we push your data collection too far, then you're going to be scrambling to get it and analyze everything and make the poster. And it feels like that's really far off, but like November starts. So yes, technically Friday at midnight, if y'all need more time, I mean, particularly pushing to Monday, it's fine. So yeah, you know, honestly, just choose a member of your group to email it into me. And then I'll, when I get it, I get it. I know when you're done. You don't even have to let me know if it's going to be late. It's basically, again, the deadlines in this class are to guide you <laughs> to be like, this is when you should get stuff done by. But then I'm, again, trying to be very understanding and uh, the fact that we all have crazy lights right now. I think that, like, I may be the best example of that this semester, right? <laughs> so uh, basically, we're turning in everything on day two, Friday, and then we're going to be doing the other two days no so sbss we're going to use after you collect your data so sbss just allows you to analyze your data so you're either going to print you decide as a group if you want to print them out and hand them out to people to fill out or if you want to use something like a google form to have people fill out and then you'll collect the data and then we'll put it into sbss and we'll have days in class where we can do that together okay so you, you don't you don't want the actual biggest um uh, tests Exactly. Yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. And in fact, you should not collect data from people until you get this approved. <laughs> so we don't have to like go and ask people. Uh, not yet. Uh, yeah, wait till I've looked it over just okay. because I might find something that I that be a good suggestion or like, hey, you missed this or whatever. And then the other thing is like, technically, were you to go through the IRB process, if you collected any data before you got the approval, you'd have to throw it out. Exactly, and everything goes in this one document. Um, so, like, this is the IRB, and then they can set forth here, and then here's where you copy paste your demographics, here's where you copy paste your questionnaires, then the debriefing. So, it's all in one big document. And again, if you want to put it in a Google Doc to share, that's fine, and then just link to send the link. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Good, good. That's why I wanted to make sure I went over this in class because as people started asking me questions, I think I bet everybody has some suggestions. So, I was like, you know, I would be a lot of conversations.
<laughs> no, no, no. Yeah, that's why I want you to get this in as soon as possible because then you'll have essentially the whole month of November to get your first people. And again, like in theory, you can do it in an hour. I don't necessarily recommend it, <laughs> but you know, it doesn't have to take that long to get first people. And obviously, email me or set up an appointment if anything becomes really pressing or grab me before or after class on Friday. Sounds good. Cool. Well, I am going to just finish. So here is what is happening, um, just based on the pacing of things. And I am fine with taking it. So there's a reason I schedule like four days for intelligence fest because I know there's a lot of fun stuff I get to show you and whatnot. So um, I think what's going to happen is we'll finish this lecture today. Friday, we will probably just cover neuropsych assessments. Although we might get a chance to start giving them to each other. Um, so again, if you can be here Friday in person, try to do so because then we can start that process. And then Monday we'll do that. And again, we'll do those, those uh, giving each other the neuropsych assessment. And that's when we'll create our official pairs and all that stuff. You've been keeping like the GRE questions and the career questionnaire. You will give to your partner because they're going to write up the report about you basically. So, um, yeah, all that to say, we may start the neuropsych thing on Friday, but we won't stick. We'll definitely use Monday for part of that. So, if for some reason you can't be here Friday, it will be okay, but definitely plan to, if at all possible, be here in person both Friday and Monday, because that's something you can't do remotely because you have to have a person like Floss. Alrighty, so we went through the waste and we went through all of the changes. Um, and I went through all these, sorry. Let me get to the right slide. We talked about the psychometric properties. They're pretty darn good. So all this stuff you all are gonna be doing with your questionnaire, they basically do with any assessment they create. Right, so they tested reliability like you all are going to do. Um, they would have compared it when they initially developed it to existing uh, tests. Um, and they would have gone from there, right? So they would have said, okay, how does this relate to the Stanford Binet? How does this relate to um, you know, other existing intelligence tests? And I think some of that is still in the technical manuals of like, this is how it relates to like Raven's progressive matrices or other existing things. Okay, so they do reliability, they also do validity. Um, so generally, good stuff. All right, so the WIS. As I talked about briefly the other day, uh, basically, WIS was started by making an adult intelligence scale, right? So he really wanted to take what Stanford Bay and all those lovely people had done and translate it to adults. But then they kind of realized, well, what part of the market, right? Like, let's be honest, when you're selling something like an assessment, you have to kind of think of it like a business. Part of the market is kids. So they took the waste and basically aged it down. Um, and then, as I mentioned at the end of class on Monday, the really interesting thing is now the waste, uh, the WISP, which is the children's one, gets revived first. And again, I think part of that is just because it gets more um, use, like we're more commonly doing this, and probably there are more people interested in child intelligence in recent years. Um, so originally the WISP came from the waste, and now it kind of leads the way for new revisions. So the WISP does not have the VIQ and the PIQ, like the waste that has these four index scores, and I think the WISP four came out five years or so before the waste four. So we'd already had these before the waste did. So the same four index scores we talked about, same things in terms of these are uh, mean of 100, standard deviation of 15. And it will also give you a full scale IQ. 
So it parallels the waist in many ways. You look at the full scale IQ, you look at the four indices, you see, are there any big discrepancies, right? So maybe this is a kiddo who's doing great on processing speed, but they're like really bombing the verbal stuff, right? You might wanna look at what's going on there. Maybe there's dyslexia, right? Um, and then you also wanna look at um, sort of generating hypotheses, and then that can lead you, particularly in kids, but certainly in adults as well, to come for, for larger scale neuropsychological assessments to say, what else should I test this person on, right? Do they seem to be having, again, more math related issues or perceptual? Maybe they really struggle on block design. So I wanna bring in other visual spatial tests, right? To have them do, to really parse that out. The WISC also has really good psychometrics. Um, the validity is really good. Uh, they have 100 boys and 100 girls for the age range, which is 6 to 16. You might be like, what are about people who are more than 16? What about people who are less? So 16 is actually the age at which you can start taking the weight, the adult person. Underneath that is the WISC which we will also talk about today. All right, so let me, oops, present again <laughs> and go back to slide. And I can actually show you, I do not have a more recent way, uh, WISC. Uh, by the way, the WISC is the Wexler Adult Intelligence Scale. The WISC is the Wexler Intelligence Scale for children. The WIPSI, I'm going to have to look up because I forget it every time, but I have the manual right here. So, <laughs> but it's unnecessarily complicated. Um, so, the Some of this overlaps with the WISP, so it'll give you good ideas. So the WISP starts at two years, six months, and goes up to six years. I was really good friends with a couple of our child people, child psychology people, um, who in my PhD program. And they basically, if a parent came and wanted a kiddo tested who was like three, you know, really under kindergarten, they'd be like, why? <laughs> and basically, their job would turn into kind of doing therapy on the parent to figure out why this was so important to them. Unless there was like a really good reason they generally wouldn't give a whip to someone, you know, under kindergarten. Just because 
what are you going to do if you find out your three-year-old skipped it? That's different than what you might do otherwise. You're going to put them in a good preschool? You should do that anyway if you can afford it. So, um, But it does go as young as two years, six months. I'm just trying to imagine someone getting my daughter to sit down and she wants to decide. Like, God bless child clinical people. Um, <laughs> I, that is not my strength. Um, so there are verbal, performance, and full-scale IQ. But there's also five composite scores. And it's designated for the youngest children. Uh, a little bit similar to some of the like Stanford Binet type stuff in that it's arranged developmentally within each subtest. Uh, each revision has updated norms. The standardization sample tries to follow the most recent census. So I think what I have is the WIPC3. And so that means they're on the WIPC4 now. We have basically Dr. Moore's wife gave me all the stuff that was out of date um, because I can't use it anymore. Um, it is good for kiddos with weak language skills because a lot of the stuff is verbal. So uh, let me thank you for with me. And some people who got here early today heard me say, like, this is literally the first time I've touched the WIPC since I've come to WIPC. So, like, objects of friendly kiddos. It's stuff like you know, it's just adorable. <laughs> um, and it gives a little more complicated, like building a tree with like six pieces. <laughs> but you know, again, you have to imagine someone who's like kindergarten age or younger taking this, right? It actually goes from two years, six months to seven years, three months. And there are subsets that you can add in as they get older. For something like comprehension, how we talked about on the way, they do have like a child appropriate version of that, but you're not going to give it to a person. Right. But every once they get that four, you might be able to add part of them to that. So, um, stimulus books, very similar. So, things like uh, picture concepts. I'm not familiar with, but it looks like you kind of have to say what the images are. You know, I have this. So, this is the beautiful thing about any Wexler scale is I know how to define stuff in here because they're all laid out the same way. Here we go. Picture content. Um, so, you open up a stimulus book and say, look here, right about the front row. Look down here, right about the second row. Pick one here that goes with one here. So, yeah, I guess there's stuff about like volume, um, stuff about like different kinds of toys. Yeah, so like this one. A foot in the hand, you could say go together. The eye and the ear, because they're sensory, the foot in the hand, because there are extremities, right? Things along those lines. Like one of the samples is alligator and turtle. And you say the alligator goes with this turtle. They're both animals. Let's try another one. <laughs> I just, again, I, God bless people who can try it. Um, there's vocabulary, again, it's going to start at a much sort of lower level um, than some of the other ones. So, and again, instead of being the word, it'll be like, oh, it's a big um, There is a age reasoning you can give to the slightly older kids, um, but it starts really simple. And again, will be approachable for kiddos. So, like, you want a banana to go with the other banana. Is information. So instead of just factoids, um, you might have pictures that they answer in response to. So let me try to find the directions for this. But I think it's essentially here we go. It's like. Um, you actually start with things like a picture of a hamburger. Show me what you can eat. Show me your nose. Touch it. Show me your knee. Touch it. So things like that. Um, and there is a picture completion as well. And then in this one, we have. Yeah, this one's the picture completion. 
questions. So again, nice big things and you, they would say what's missing. These are really obvious, but like the code is missing a sleeve, right? And then you get to do stuff like this kiddo is missing one of his front teeth, <laughs> um, which is adorable, and it's supposed to. Uh, let's see. I think that's everything in terms of this. So again, some of these types of items would be on the list as well. Uh, and so you could see that overlap. All right, we got through all the reps for scales. So on Friday, we'll start talking about neuropsych assessments. And then um, either starting Friday or Monday, y'all will get the chance to do a neuropsych assessment on each other.